morning, everybody. Would you stand with us as we just worship together this morning? recognize that that you are a God who loves us and that we would just worship your holy name regardless of the circumstances that are going on around us or we just have so much to be thankful for and even in times of trouble you are good you are good to us each and every one of us and I just ask you just help us to recognize that and that we could, we could just look past our circumstances and realize that what it is that you've done for us Lord on the, in this day that we're celebrating Memorial Day we just want to remember those who have given their lives, paid the ultimate sacrifice and, and, and service to our country. 
and we just want to remember them and and we want to appreciate what it is that they have done for us but lord we just ultimately we want to recognize and remember what it is that you've done for us you've also you paid the ultimate sacrifice by giving your life for each and every one of us and uh, and some did it out of love of country but you did it out of your love for us for the whole world and we just thank you and we just praise you for that that we have a god who is just willing to give up his life and and to die for us that we might just have eternal life with you. So, Lord, just help us to, to live that way, to recognize that and our appreciation for what it is that you have done for each one of us, that we would just be willing to lay down our lives for you. We lift up all of these things in your precious name. Amen. Jesus conquered the 
the children to get downstairs for children's church just walk around and just greet one another this morning find somebody you don't know and just say hello make them feel welcome the best songs come straight out of scripture and this is one of those um it it comes from psalm 46 uh verse 10 it just says be still and know that i am god i will be exalted among the nations i will be exalted in the earth and this is a psalm that's it's filled with a lot of um, turmoil and um, and trouble uh, images of of war and um, uh, disasters and and a lot of noise and just chaos uh, and and this is the the second to last verse in the in the chapter and just in in the midst of all that noise and trouble God just says uh, just just be still be be silent and know that I'm God so this is called be still and know God. Be still and know that He is. 
is holy. Be still, O restless soul of mine. Now before the Prince of Peace, let the noise and clamor cease. Be still and know that He is God. Thanks, guys. We have been uh, working our way through Timothy, 1 Timothy. Uh, this is our fourth week in Timothy. And, uh, and if you remember from the beginning, we, we uh, pointed out that the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy was intended to establish what is the proper conduct of the church. How do we behave in the church? How do we function as a church? And so we spent a good bit of time talking about leadership. The first week in First Timothy chapter 1, we looked at false teaching in the church and then spent a couple of weeks really talking about the role of leadership and the roles that, that we play in the church. And now we're going to return to false teaching, but, but it's important that we see that the false teaching that he is focusing on, he is doing so because false teaching relates to leadership or teaching. And so as we consider the positions of, of elder, overseer in the church, and the teachers in the church, uh, the idea, the importance of, of false teaching or not having false teaching is, is critical. And so we're going to continue to, to look at that today. Um, we're going we're gonna to look today at the idea of falling away. You remember that, that old uh, commercial? I don't know if they have it on anymore where the, the little, little lady falls over and and she says, I've fallen and I can't get up. And uh, it's a for life alert system is what it's an advertisement for. But, but we're going to look at today is that that same picture occurs in the church where there are those that fall and they can't get up. And we're going to look at that today, why that is the case. Why there are those that fall away and they're unable to get back. 
And we're going to see that, that, that Paul describes this to Timothy and, and he describes it for a couple of reasons. One is that so that we recognize what brings this about in the church and what do we do when this occurs in the church. And, and so we're going to look today at the idea of apostasy. Uh, falling away, and I think you're going to maybe be a little surprised that apostasy isn't maybe exactly what you always thought it was. And, and so we're going to consider the way that Paul describes apostasy to uh, Timothy here in the, uh, in the fourth chapter of 1 Timothy. You know, my wife got her garden planted this week. Teresa loves the garden, and I, I've shared that before. My, my role in the gardening uh, the, the adventure of gardening is essentially I'm the rototiller man. After that, I'm pretty much out of the picture. And I'm okay with that. But, but Teresa will spend a great amount of time in her garden. In fact, I would say that she is sort of a gardening superhero. And, and in the same way that every superhero has an arch nemesis, so does my wife. Superman has has Lex Luthor, Batman, has the Joker, the Spider-Man has the Green Goblin, and my wife has the Rabbit. <laughs> that is her arch nemesis right there. The Rabbit wreaks havoc in our garden. And so she, she, is, uh, she is worse than Elmer Fudd on a rabbit hunt. <laughs> And so, and so at our house, we, we, we take great, go to great measures to keep the rabbits out of the garden. And, and uh, just yesterday, I began training my grandson, Aiden, to help keep the rabbits out of the garden. And we were standing in our, in our, uh, our sliding glass doors looking out over the garden, and I saw there was a rabbit about six feet away from the garden. And I said, I, I said, Aiden, we got we to chase him off. And so I, I got Aiden yelling at the rabbits. And so I, I couldn't tell exactly what he's saying, but I think it was something about the demon bunny. And, and, so, and so now when he stands in the door and he sees a rabbit, he begins to yell at the rabbit to, to scare it off, to, to, to frighten it away. It didn't work, what, the timing wasn't real good because they went to the zoo yesterday. And, and I, I think at the zoo, everything looks like a rabbit apparently. Because he wanted to yell at the animals. <laughs> but in the same way that, that our garden needs protected from, from the, the, uh, the perils, the, the, the threats that come to the garden, in the same way it's true in the church. That there are threats that, that threat, threaten the health and, and the life of, of our church. And, and, and the scripture is full of those warnings. And today we're going to look at that. As, as Paul is going to warn Timothy, in fact, this church in Ephesus that he is addressing apparently is already experiencing the problems, the, the apostasy. And, and we're going to see where that apostasy originates from this morning. We're going to look at that. And our hope is this, that we will be able to recognize what brings it about so that we can guard against it, so that we can protect ourselves against the threat of apostasy in our church. But also, what, what can we do not to just only guard ourselves against it, but to prevent it? What can we do to, to act in a, an offensive, positive way to make sure that we're not confronted with the, the problem of apostasy in our church? That's going to be the focus of, of Paul's letter today to Timothy. It's going to be the focus of our, our message as we consider uh, this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Before we read God's word this morning, though, let's uh, bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the, the time you give us. We, we just so look forward, God, to opening your word and to digging into it, to, to, seeking, uh, to seek understanding, Lord, to, to apply these truths to our life, not just as a church, Lord, not just collectively, but God, individually, so that we can be prepared to serve you, to live for you, to be prepared, God, when, when we are confronted with false teaching, when we're confronted with the apostasy in our church, Lord, that we respond in a way that, that would be pleasing to you, in a way that would protect our church. We, we look forward, God, direct us through this time. Uh, equip us, change us in whatever way is needed. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. 
In 1 Timothy chapter 4, I'm going to read through the first 10 verses. It says, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all people and especially those who believe. You know, the, the, the idea of apostasy, it comes from the word here, abandon, in the NIV. It says those who abandon the faith. And it comes from the, the, the Greek word, aphistemi, which means to depart from, to, to leave, to walk away from. And it carries with it an idea that it is self-induced. That it is something that I have personally chosen to do. I, I haven't been drug away. Someone hasn't pulled me into this abandonment. But I have chosen to walk away, to, to leave in, in a sense. And so... Um, that is the term that we're looking at in the aphistemi is where we get the word apostasy. It's exactly where that, that word comes from. And when he says in later times, oftentimes we hear that and we immediately think of, well, the last days, the, the time just before Jesus returns. But it really doesn't mean that here. It means from today, any time later than this, this is going to happen. And so Paul warned of this and it was fulfilled right before their eyes. And so he warned that in later times, that means at a later point in history, these things are going to happen, and they happen continually throughout history, and they will continue to happen, and there may be a, a, a surge in it in the time just before Christ returns, but regardless, it isn't something that's just all of a sudden going to appear. It has been here since the very beginning of, of, of church history. And... and and we need to think about it this. He's been talking about teaching. He's been talking about leadership. And so what he's talking about here, as he talks about apostasy, he is relating that to the effects of false teaching. It is a continuation of the teaching that we have been, we have been looking at. And notice that apostasy, that false teaching, this deception that occurs, does not walk through the front door. It does not announce itself. It is not obvious. It describes it as deception. It is something that will appear good. It will it'll appear appealing. And yet it isn't. It is, it is harmful and dangerous. And, and, and we're going to look at that. And so apost apostasy always originates with spiritual deception. It will always be a trick. It will always be something that looks so much better than it really is. And ultimately, Satan is at the root. I mean, we can say that it originates with deception, but deception originates with Satan. And so it is the same old trick that has been going on since the Garden of Eden, Eden where, where Satan used deception to, to fool Adam and Eve. In the same way as a church today, he will attempt to deceive us into believing something that isn't true. And that is exactly what is happening here. So what is the channel for this deception? What is the, the avenue that this deception is brought into the church? Well, he tells us in the very next verse, such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Apostasy is advanced by false teachers. By those who, who would, would lead you to believe that this is true, this is what God expects, and yet it isn't. It, it, it is false. And so, it, it is why so, it is so critical that when we have elections, when we select 
teachers and leaders that, that we do it in a way that assures that godly people are put in those positions. Because this is the avenue by which spiritual deception enters into the church. Even though it originates with Satan, Satan uses people to, to, to lead us astray. And it is why he spent such a great amount of time talking about the qualifications for godly leadership, why it is critical and why is it important. You know that doctrinal error, when it is introduced to the church, will very, 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 very rarely be introduced by just some person sitting in the congregation. Doctrinal error will be introduced and advanced by teachers. And it is why Paul is putting such great, great uh, responsibility and, and emphasis on on teachers and the need to have godly leaders and, and teachers. And notice what he says here. He describes it in this way. These, these teachers that he describes as liars, he says, whose consciences have been seared by a hot iron. What that means is there comes a point where we don't feel anymore. We don't even recognize that we're, we're, we're false teaching. We don't even recognize that we're sinning. And, and it's, it's true whether we're talking about a teacher teaching falsely or we're talking about a, a Christian sinning that as we sin over and over again, there comes to that point where you don't feel it anymore. In the same way that, it, that, that there would be that point if we were burnt over and over again, we wouldn't feel the pain anymore. That is what is happening with this. And so, uh, recurring sin will lead us to the point where we don't even recognize it anymore. You know, in the, the world today, it, I've noticed that we lack self-awareness anymore. And I, and I don't know if this is related just to the narcissism of our world and our, so, our society, the, the idea that everything is about me, and so I focus on me, and when I focus on me, I, 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 all I see is what, what I need and what is good about me. And, and so I don't see the failings and the, the problems in my own life. I, but I have no trouble seeing the failings and the problems in, in your life. And, and that seems to be really, really present in the world today. People see other people's imperfections, but they can't see their own imperfections. I was on Facebook the other day, and I, I saw a, a person had, had linked to a story. A really good story, a really good article. And it was done by the, the Barna Research Group, which they, they evaluate the, the, the attendances and the attitudes of Christians at the church today as their main... Uh, main, uh, they do a lot of polling and, and, and uh, gather information like that to, to, to kind of assess where the church is today. And they had this article and this, this person had, had linked to it on their Facebook page. And the article was called, Are Christians More Like Jesus or More Like Pharisees? And it was a really good article. In fact, if I were to ask a person who was a Christian, are you more like a Pharisee or are you more like Jesus? I would think that most Christians would say, well, I'm, I'm more like Jesus. I, I hope I'm more like Jesus. But what they did in this test was they, they, they used questions that would lead you to make a decision similar to what Jesus made or what a Pharisee would make. And in that way, it is a better way to evaluate if you would act like Jesus or if you were to act like a Pharisee in a particular situation. And it, and it showed that about half, it was close 50-50, it was pretty even, half people think they act more like a Pharisee and half people more like, a, um, a, um, like Jesus. Even though they wouldn't answer it that way when you test them, that is what is revealed, that they respond about 50-50. Half the people act like Pharisees, half the people act like Jesus. And so, what really struck me, though, was the, com the commentary, the words that were written in the comment section under the article on Facebook. Here's what, here's what people said. The first person commenting said, I know a few of these people. The next person said, a few? You certainly have a gift for the understated. The next person said, I was trying to be, or he was responding, said, I was trying to be Christ-like. The next person said, I've met some and the final comment was Pharisees totally. I was struck by that. You see the irony in this. 
He is evaluating whether people are like Pharisees or they're like Jesus. And these people in commenting were completely pharisaical and had no idea. They were doing the most pharisaical thing you could do. They were looking at somebody else and saying, he is a Pharisee. He's not acting like Jesus. An article that was beneficial that a Christian could have read and looked at and used looked at it introspectively to see their own attitudes and their own ideas instead of seeing it that way they applied it to somebody else and so and so that is the the world that we live today the culture that we live in is is such that we don't see the imperfections in our own life but boy can we see the imperfections in other people's lives. Recurring sin results in a lack of self-awareness. When I read that, I I generally, I hesitate to comment on some of these kind of debatable things on Facebook, but I wanted so much to put in there. I don't want to, as a pastor, I don't want to get in these arguments and debates with people, but I wanted to put in there, I was all set to go, I was ready to type it in there, and the award for lack of self-awareness goes to... And, and, you know, let them fill in the blank. Because it it was completely missed that the real Pharisee in this picture was that person themselves. And so, what Paul tells us is, when we are involved in sin, when sin recurs and comes back and comes back, we get to a point where we can't see it anymore. We don't even recognize it as sin. We don't experience the Holy Spirit tugging at our heart and, and pointing at the problem in our life, but we continue to see it in other people's lives. And so one of the first things that we need to do when we look at this is to make certain we look at our own life, how we respond in these situations. I went back to get a water before I came up to preach and there was no water in the refrigerator. So I'm drinking red Kool-Aid today. So if if my lips take on a pink tinge, it's not my lipstick. It's the red Kool-Aid. So I want us to think about this. When we think about apostasy, we generally go in this direction. At least me, I can speak for myself. When I think of an apostate person, I think somebody has walked away from the church. They've walked away from faith. They, they, they've completely rejected God and they've fallen into a sin or a life of unbridled sin. That's usually what I think of when I think of apostasy. But look at, at these people that he's talking about. He says this, They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. And so look, these people have not left the church. They have not walked off. They're not hanging out in the bars. They're not living a depraved and sinful life. They're still there. And yet he's calling them apostate. He's saying they've, they've fallen away is the way he's described it. And so we need to understand this. Falling away isn't always falling away from the church. But falling away is always falling away from God. You might, a person might be completely apostate from the ways of God, and yet they're still a faithful member of the church, and even in this circumstance, a teacher. And so it's important that we see that, because if we try to make everyone who's apostate some vile, sin-ridden person, we're probably going to miss the real apostates that would be present in the church Falling away, apostasy can lead to a sin-ridden life. But for whatever reason, that's not the way Paul describes it. He describes it as people who are still in the church. And notice where they're going with this. They're coming up with a set of rules. They're, they're no longer it's just about a relationship with Jesus. No longer is it experiencing the grace and love of Christ. It's about a set of rules. It's legalism. That is where these apostates have led the church. And and notice where legalism and ritual originate. Go back to verse 1 and 2. It is demonically influenced. that, That to me is like startling. Because when I look at legalism in the church, I tend to think, well, it's a, it's a good thing, just kind of, just overboard a little bit. 
You know, it's, 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 it's not bad to have these, these requirements, these rigid things that we need to follow. It's not a good thing, but yeah, you know, it's not so bad. And yet, Paul says that this comes straight from Satan. This is a demonically influenced part of, of faith. And so religious legalism is just as demonically influenced as religious liberalism. Being from somewhat conservative church background, I tend to, to fear liberalism more than legalism. I see liberalism as a, a greater, greater danger and threat to the church. And yet Paul says that they're neither one, not one's not better than the other. They're both deadly and dangerous to the church. And so this set of rules that came up that was developed is, is not a good thing going too far. It is a bad thing. It is straight from Satan. And so he gives us the reason why legalism is not a good thing. He says in verse 4 and 5, For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. And so the, the, these, these legalistic practices that were being set up by the false teachers, really it seems rooted back in that whole idea of food and eating food, that your food you couldn't eat and food you could eat. And it really seems to be from this, if we look at Acts chapter 10, verses, beginning at verse 9, it's a description of, of Peter as he struggled with this idea of of some food being uh, improper for the, for the believer to eat. It says, about, about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became angry and wanted something to... Or angry. He became hungry. Actually, anger usually follows hunger at my house. <laughs> he became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back from heaven. Paul is pointing out that these rules regarding food, what you should and shouldn't eat, aren't from God. This is not a teaching that comes from Scripture. This is something that has been added. It is a legalistic practice that has been added to faith in Christ. And so no longer is it just believing in faith in Jesus. It is following a set of rules. And I'll just kind of a, a side note here. Really, this is kind of a description of why we pray before meals. It is, you, we, we pray, we offer thanksgiving for what we have received when we sit down to eat. Now notice, we don't bless the food. It's not about getting the food blessed, it's about thanksgiving for the food. And that's the reason that, that, that probably at your house you, you pray before meals. But why would the, the, would the enemy, why would Satan want to focus on regulations and rules? Why would that be? I mean, to me, that seems like not that big a threat. I mean, what's the big deal? What's the big deal if I'm obeying rules, if I'm following a set of rules? Well, here's the reason. Because if you are following a set of rules, if your, your faith is, revolves around focused on following rules, then you're no longer focused on following Jesus. That is what it's all about. That is what Satan wants to accomplish in your life. And if he can convince you, if he can't convince you that liberalism is a good thing, that the Bible is not accurate, then maybe he can convince you that following this set of rules, it's going to make you more godly. It's going to make you, you're going to have a greater standing in heaven. And, and so, when we begin to follow rules, we are no longer following Jesus. And that is why it is so treacherous. It's so deadly. Because we don't see following rules near as bad as, as, as the opposite of that. Uh, on your bulletin today, there's a, a quote there by Sinclair Ferguson. And he said this, 
When we impose man-made regulations upon ourselves or others and lose sight of our liberty to do or not do those things which Scripture neither commands nor forbids, we destroy the fruit of the Spirit and we cease to grow or to allow others to grow. So Paul has described this, this danger of false teaching and the apostasy that follows that, that false teaching. But now he begins to instruct Timothy, the young pastor, on what to do about that. What do you do in regards to this in your church? Well, look at verse 6. He says, If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. He begins by saying, you need to be aware of these things. You need to be aware that there are going to be those who come into the church and they want to give you a set of rules that this is what you got to do, this is what you got to follow. And he's saying, if you point that out to the brothers and sisters, if you point out to the people in the church, you're being a good minister. You're doing what you should do. And so the first thing that he is alerting us in this is that the leaders of that church, the elders... Those who are responsible for oversight and and the the teaching in the church must make sure that people are aware of this. That you understand the danger of this. And and you're able to recognize that when it would would show up in in the church. If you go back to chapter 3, where we dealt with the responsibility of the elder, preaching, teaching, oversight, this is simply... A practical demonstration of that. He is saying, if you are keeping an eye on things, if you are preaching and teaching, and you are warning the people about this danger, you are doing what you are supposed to do. And so, notice as it goes on to say there, that you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith. And this is the greatest defense that we have against apostasy in the church. That's the truth. And so our primary means of defense is accomplished through the accurate preaching of Scripture. It is accurate teaching and preaching of Scripture. It is the proclaiming of the truth. As a church, we combat apostasy by proclaiming the truth. If the truth continues to be proclaimed from the pulpit, from the various teaching positions in this church, it is much, much less likely that we will fall into apostasy because we're being exposed to the truth. The truth of Scripture is, should be prominent here. And so when church leaders fail to proclaim the truth, then the congregation becomes less and less familiar with the truth. So if I, as the pastor, venture off into into crazy land and I am not presenting the truth of the gospel, you as a congregation are going to become less and less aware of truth, less and less likely to be able to identify truth. And if you can't identify truth, you can't identify deception. You can't identify the lie. And that's why it's so critical that we make certain that we continue to be all about proclaiming the truth of the gospel as a church. But I want you to notice that that in itself isn't sufficient. That Paul continues on that that there's more than that because here's the problem. If you are completely dependent upon me for truth and I venture off of the truth, I begin to to veer off into things that the Bible speaks nothing about, you aren't going to be able to be aware aware of that. In fact, if you are completely dependent upon me, you will follow me into crazy land. And so so it is not sufficient only for the, the elders, the pastor, those who are in positions of authority to just alert you and warn you and proclaim the truth. It goes even, it it is, um, goes further than that. You know, when you, we look around our community, communities, and even if you're not from around here, you look around your community that you live in, I'm sure you would say that there are a lot of churches that are pretty much sitting empty, maybe empty, as this church was before we arrived. And so, 
Why is that? I think it goes right back to this. Somewhere along the line, some pastor stopped proclaiming the truth. And some congregation followed him. And eventually, a church sits empty and, and, and useless for God. And so, just counting on the pastor, the elder, the leaders, to proclaim the truth and to protect you from the truth, or protect you from the lie, is, is not fully sufficient. In fact, it is why Paul's letter continues with another safeguard of the congregations. It's a safeguard for those congregations whose pastor has stumbled away, who is, who is no longer preaching the truth. Verse 7 through 10 says, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. You know, if Teresa, if, if her work on her garden was this, we planted it, and now we're going to depend on Aiden to stand at the door and to ward off the bunnies. If that was our, the extent of our plan this year, even if it was, even if we didn't, we put someone on guard 24 hours to stand there at the door and, and ward off any rabbits that may have entered into the perimeter of the garden. Even if we did that, that does not guarantee that her garden would grow. That is, in fact, that would be, would be almost useless if that was the extent of her gardening, how she depended on, on her garden growing. No, I can tell you that she will spend a lot of time nurturing her garden. She will spend a lot of time watering, feeding, weeding, working on her garden to make certain that it, it grows. She's going to nourish it. She's going to nurture it so that it will grow. And it's the same picture that Paul is describing here. That, that, yeah, it's important that your pastor proclaim the truth. It's important that your leadership protect you from false teaching. But there is a responsibility that you bear also in this. There's a personal responsibility. Your relationship with God needs nourishment. It needs nurture. It needs care. And so, Paul closes with that. You see, you don't get a free pass if the pastor walks away from the truth. You aren't going to get an opportunity to say, well, I didn't know Pastor Dan was, was speaking about things that I, I believe, I thought he knew he was talking about. You, you don't get that. You bear a personal responsibility. And, and your ability to, to, to be able to, to decipher truth from lie is dependent on your relationship with God. The nurture, the care, the discipline that goes into your relationship with Jesus. And it's for that reason that Paul instructs Timothy that individual disciples need to stand strong in your faith in Christ and grow in your faith in Christ. In the same way that the Christ follower needs nourishment to bring growth, uh, it is what enables the believer to stand strong when we are confronted with, with lies. An individual follower of Christ we, as individual followers of Christ, we combat apostasy through spiritual discipline. Why do you read your Bible? I hope you read your Bible. Why do you pray? Why do we worship together? Why do you belong to a small group? Why, do you, uh, why are you involved in youth group? Now, the reason, you might have various reasons you might way you respond to that but the reason ultimately is this it is through that spiritual discipline that you will be built up strengthened encouraged and enabled to live for Christ in in times when it's even difficult successful christian living does not just happen it, it's a product of successful christian discipline faithfully engaging the scriptures and 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 being involved in in, in the fellowship of the church. You know, there's a lot of kids in this congregation that are involved in sports. Some of them are, are the, the girls' softball team at Southern is, 
getting ready to play in the district finals. The, I don't know if there's any of the boys from Mount Union are getting ready to play in their district finals. There, there are kids that just completed participating in, at the district level and track. I can tell you that they did not just show up this past Thursday to play a game. They have been working, they have been practicing, they have been disciplining themselves for that day. Todd has the, the girls whose basketball season doesn't start till December practicing at the gym the, this week. Why? Because if they are going to be able to perform effectively when games start, they need to put the discipline in today. And the same thing is true about our, our relationship with Christ. We can't just expect to walk out here and, and, and live strong if we have not disciplined ourselves in the ways of Jesus, in, in Scripture, in prayer, in, in, in worship time. All of that is critical in us being able to faithfully continue the ministry of this church. We need to be able to recognize apostasy, false teaching when it's put before us so that we can reject it. And that happens through spiritual discipline. I just want to review real quick. We need to be protected. We need to protect the truth. We need to, we need to advance, proclaim the truth. And, and we need to, to, to continue to seek the truth so that we can stand so that we can serve God in the way that he has called us to. Let's pray together. <laughs> Lord, thank you today for your word. Thank you for the, the privilege it is to proclaim your truth. God, I pray for each person here. Lord, that, that as leaders, as elders, as teachers, God, we would be so connected with you, Lord, that we couldn't speak anything but the truth. Protect us. Guard us, Lord, as a congregation from falling into false teaching. Lord, for the followers, the congregation who sits before me, Lord, create in their life, create in their heart a hunger, a passion for the truth as they, God, serve you, as they live for you. Strengthened, encouraged, protected by the truth of the gospel. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, and we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.
Thank you.